Hello, welcome back to uh, the, the Digital Dialogue, the Asynchronous Lecture Series. Taking questions uh, from students, receiving questions from Tia at the moment, had a brief interruption. Technology, right? People, people trying to cut in line of our communication. Um, so uh, fortunately, we were right at the end of one question, kind of starting a different, different conversational uh, thread, and we'll just move on. Um, so, uh, looking at Scott Goodson's uprising, how to build a brand and change the world by sparking cultural movements, Tia is writing from chapter two, from thinking small to getting real, when she writes, large companies can rely on popularity to make marketing movements, marketing movement advertisements famous. How should small companies use advertisements to create movements and promote them? And he, here's an essential, right? If we're taking notes, uh, people need to take more notes in, in, in this in this day and age. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a student or not, right? Uh, understand who your audience is, right? Bottom line, identify the need in your product. What's your need to help you understand who is your audience and then make sure, make certain that those two are aligning uh, in where you are putting your advertising or marketing money and labor, what direction you're putting in it toward, um, or uh, you will likely waste, right? You will waste all of that, of that money. You've got to be in sync with understanding your company, its purpose, its mission, and where it's pointing, and that it that how you're sharing that communication is being translated and transferred across the appropriate channels and potentially mass mediums, right? Should you be, should, should you be using traditional advertising or should you be using, you know, new media strategies? Uh, and then that transcends company size. It really does. I think it's a different game once you become a sound, solid, recognizable brand. It's, it's a little bit of a different game. And Scott Goodson writes about this in the book. Spreadable media, creating value and meaning in a networked culture. Tia writes, companies want to spend less money to do more accurate marketing. So how should, so how to choose social media that better matches the direction of product promotion? Once again, where is your consumer audience? All right ask and then find the answer to that, then market to them as directly as possible. I'm going to use an industry term here. This is where, this is where we uh, uh, devise this, this, this uh, use of narrow casting, right? You've heard of broadcasting, like broadcast networks. It's going to the widest audience possible. Uh, narrow casting is trying to go to the most specific narrow audience possible. You you want to understand that, especially w when you're dealing with razor thin margins uh, of profitability or organizational size, and you've got to have your marketing or ad campaigns directed in the right direction. There's there's no wrong, there's no getting by with you know advertising to the wrong group, the wrong message. It's it is literally flushing money down the toilet. Okay, and finally, let's let's. Queue up questions from Rebecca. Excited to take those. Nice challenging questions here. Beginning with Emily Potter's interviewing for journalists. Coming out of chapter four, Rebecca writes, quote, most people have a Twitter or Instagram account, and these can be an efficient way of messaging them, them as in subjects, from Lee Potter, page 57. This is an interesting concept that seems like it can come off as lazy or informal. Are there any circumstances we should avoid going to social media uh, to reach a desired interviewee? And here's what it is. In the past, perhaps. Now, absolutely, social media was previously seen as that very casual, informal nature, a personal zone that we don't want to break the, the threshold to cross. <laughs> Let's look at how multi multi uh, level marketing people are, are destroying that personal zone, right? To, to kind of 
build up their product lines and uh i i mean i mean their their friends right um I, I jest but but it's important to say these lines have have increasingly blurred and all the way back to the the first part of our lecture series in week two we talked about understand that you know what is your need have you exhausted the professional channels of outreach is there a phone is there no phone if you can't find a phone do you have you know the email or vice versa uh, most most everyone has an email but it but if you can't find the contact email then use a social media channel perhaps now uh here, here, a recent example that comes to mind a student uh attempting to penetrate social media boundaries about a question that uh was coming in uh, shall we say beyond late pertinent to the subject matter and it seemed like it was a uh, uh, you know that, that inappropriate attempt to cross boundaries um especially if it was regarding anything that, that, that had a kind of legal nature to it that 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 you know could jeopardize either party so um it's it's all about what, what why are we connecting why are we reaching out and and are we being authentic you know or do we mean them well or mean them harm you know it's not uh, another example comes to mind uh being reached out through direct messaging uh, in, in a way that suggests just friendly, casual encounter, but the true intent is it's yet another attempt to draw someone into, you know, purchasing something or buying something, it, you know, exhausting a source for, for, pro, for monetary gain. And, you know, that's an ethical boundary. Um, so you gotta be careful about it. You want to be strategic. Don't, don't, don't pull that trigger unless you have to, but we are seeing, if, if that's the only way you can reach out to someone, maybe even if they're a, a stranger, uh, go for it, but but do it privately, you know, be be ethical. Don't, don't, don't be blasting someone publicly, right, with, with that kind of question. In this day and age, quote, there's no excuse not to have a raft of background information before you start, end quote, page 62. Would you see this as an advantage or disadvantage for interviewers? Wait, what? Well, what's it? Um, not is do we by it do we mean not doing any advanced research? This would be an incredible disadvantage. Uh, it would show incompetence on our part on a, on an interviewee's part. It, it's a missed opportunity every single time out of the gate. Do the, what research you can. This is this this gets at yeah. Not, and let's let's use an immediate case example. Uh, from this class, we had an interview subject. It was an opportunity where I felt like I made a judgment call. It was better to share their resume because there's so many rich examples of diverse professional experience that I couldn't, I couldn't logically include in a really short preview video, you know, three to five minute video. I couldn't really fit all that in, but there was so much there that was fair game that was worthy for us to investigate. But if the questions for the interview sound so kind of can like they're just riffing right, like pulling right out of the, the CV line, including words and phrases, I mean, words fine, but, but phrasing or whatever, especially if phrasing is out of context, um, it can, it can almost become cynical, right? So, so the interviewee almost, they did no longer, it, it, instead of feeling personal, it feels like, you know, incompetent almost. So, so we have to, wording is essential in, in, in this. Um, and you, but you don't want to miss, you, missed opportunity every single time, right? If, if we're not doing our research on a subject. Next question, as you become more experienced, this is from Lee Potter's book. Another way to establish rapport is to mirror your interviewee's body language and match the way that they are sitting uh, from page 75. Is the interviewer supposed to change positions every time the interviewee does? If so, how does one not make it noticeable? Ah, this is a suggestion, right? And it's perhaps referring to interviewers. Um, let's, let's remember this more than body language and how we're sitting. Interviewing is, to, to the point, a dance. It's a communicative dance. And you're doing everything 
to make your subject comfortable. This is why, you know, what's the formality? Are you meeting in a public place, right? Are you meeting in a lounge for, you know, uh, a beverage? And if, 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 if they're ordering, are you ordering? Or, you know, the whole idea of looking at your notes, but not just reading verbatim what you've written down. Uh, that's so, it's so impersonal, right? It's like, I can't have a conversation with this person. So it's communicating a kind of lack on your part, a negligence. Um, but yeah, if they're very comfortable, you're very comfortable. Don't, don't try to, you know, stand out like I'm pointedly taking these hand notes while we're, you know, eating sushi or something like that, right? Uh, so follow their lead. It's a dance, right? Get, go with the flow in that way. And if you go deeper into ethnography training, we're talking about that field notes level of rigorous note taking. That all of those, those sort of textbooks, those manuals will teach you that when that interview is over, you better get, uh, you better get yourself to keyboard, notepad, whatever. A keyboard is going to be optimal here. It's faster. And you better write down as much as possible before, uh, before your memory starts to get fuzzy or clogged up, right? Or distractions, right? The, the, the further we remove ourselves from the exchange to the point in which we take some notes on it, that the more damaging that is to accuracy. And, and that's an ethical concern, but it can be a professional concern. Final question, final question, week two. When you're on a deadline and to get a story, don't overlook your interviewee's feelings and emotions about the subject or event they're talking about, end quote, page 77. When I think about a journalist, I imagine someone who is trying to get information out of you so their article can have higher views. How can someone show empathy while trying to get strong information out of the interview? And here, here, here is a takeaway. Uh, real journalists know that they can't control everything, right? And it's, it's a takeaway we can all appreciate. Real journalists, real. I mean, you know, highly vetted, ethically, you know, versed. Let the information speak for itself. You're not, you're not trying to force a certain narrative. That, that can be dangerous. Let the information tell the narrative that you want to tell. Tell it in your voice, but let the information speak for itself. I, I think that gotcha approach, I think trying to go out, trying to weave an interviewee's responses to what you want your readers to hear or something like that is dangerous, right? Um, and it, it, checks and balances matter, even if they're just internal, right? If we're just having internal checks and balances. But a great editor will hold your feet to the fire. A great editor will catch these things. And I think that's important. That's my final thought is if it's well written, well edited, which one of the huge issues I see in so much clickbait nonsense, internet based writing today is a lack of editing, whether it's grammar or just bleh, the absence, the absence of substance. And um, additionally, relatively well publicized, right? So even if something is well written, well edited, well, well publicized, it still may never reach that ideal audience. And that's why, at least for journalists, you have to keep going. You've got to forge ahead no matter what. And, um, you know, sometimes a, an article can hit and catch fire. It could go viral later, months later. It can happen. Um, but the consistency and the quality and the personal, right, the personal ethics matter. Thank you guys for engaging this session. Appreciate these week two questions uh, and a value, greatly value your insights into the reading. You're picking up on excellent themes and presenting that in a, in a highly logical fashion. And it's exciting to be able to share in this information exchange with you. Thank you for listening.